I'm going to make this stromboli first. So I've got my dough right here. In a bowl, I've got a little bit more of that semolina, that fine semolina flour. This is what I use for my dusting flour, or we refer to this as bench flour. Um, this is going to be my working flour that I'm going to use. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to take a little bit of this, and I'm going to go just around the edges of the dough. And at this point, I'm going to turn this out into my hand. I'm going to let it just fall into my hand very easily. The reason I'm doing this is because I want to keep all the gases inside of it here as much as I can. I'm going to put flour on both sides, all right? So this again is that semolina flour. And the idea here is that now you can see that this is like a pillow. There's a lot of air inside over here. So as I'm pressing, what I'm going to use is I'm going to use my fingers from about the second knuckle to the tip of my finger. And the action of pressing the dough should kind of look like I'm playing the piano. All right, if that makes sense. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to start at the middle of the dough. I'm not going to start at the end. I'm going to start the middle of the dough and I'm going to very gently work my way towards you. And the idea being that as I press down, the air is getting trapped inside over here. Now you can see the back part here where I didn't press down has all the air still in it. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to flip this over. Here's the equator line in the middle and I'm going to do the same exact thing but working towards you. Now the reason why I did this in this manner is because by separating the difference from the middle to the one side and then flipping it over and doing the same thing, what happens is I don't have all that pressure of the gases. If I started here at one end, it would continue to build and build and build. And by the time I got to the end, it would just, it would all escape out the other side. So by splitting the difference, going half and half, it's going to allow me to trap more of those air bubbles inside of the dough, creating a structure that's going to be more open and light and airy. Okay. Now, once I've got this so that I went all the way on one, oh, to one direction, all right, half and half with the flip, I'm going to take this, I'm going to flip it over 90 degrees, and I'm going to start again at the middle, and I'm going to work my way again towards you, and then flip this over one more time in the middle and working my way towards you. Now, the thing that I love about this, I'm going to brush this off. I don't know if you guys can see this so closely, and maybe this will be in the edits later, but this now, can you see how much air we've trapped inside over here? I use this exact same method when I'm doing, let's say, a focaccia bread, something that I want a lot of open, nice, airy structure to. And this, again, is this, the reason why we're not using a rolling pin. Okay, if you have to use a rolling pin to stretch your dough, I get it. But this has to be in your repertoire of what do you do on a rainy Sunday afternoon? Make some dough and practice this technique because you will improve. Your baked goods will improve if you do some little steps just like this. The stromboli now what I'm doing, I'm going to try to make this into a long um, kind of like rectangle. And the best way that I can do this is to use a little bit of olive oil. Now, we're working on this beautiful uh, mount, uh, marble granite uh, crag countertop, whatever material this is, right? So this number one, using stone, this is going to keep your dough nice and cool as you're working, all right? So somebody had asked earlier about the temperature of the kitchen. Cooking or baking on a piece of stone is going to help that process, keeping the dough under control while you're working with it. I've got some olive oil here. This is really good olive oil from Sicily. I'm from Calabria, I'm at the toe of the boot uh, in Italy. And uh, just across the water, the little island is Sicily. And we've got some of the greatest products that come out of Italy from Sicily and, uh, and Calabria. And then we start going north into Campania and Naples and Puglia. And as we go further north, there's so much great stuff in the southern Italy. And I love this, I'm using this a lot as uh, Partana oil, uh, which is uh, from Sicily. Beautiful peppery flavor. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to put just a little bit of olive oil right on the stone of my counter. And the reason why I'm going to do this is because I'm going to spread some of this oil just like this. And what I want to do now is as I lay the dough onto here, all of a sudden I've made like a lubricant, which is going to allow this dough to slide really nice and easy. But it's also going to be a little tacky underneath. So as I push on this, as the gluten wants to snap back a little bit, um, we're going to have a, we're going to actually hold it into place. 
The platinum yeast that we're using, I feel like it, uh, it opens up the dough a little bit, so it even relaxes the gluten a little bit more. So I really don't have a lot of that snapback that we talk about all the time. I know there's probably, I get questions all the time about this, is how do you, how do you stretch your dough and keeping, keeping it from snapping back? And the answer is very simple, don't abuse the dough. The dough is gonna tell you when it's overworked. How do you know? It's gonna snap back. If you see that the dough is snapping back, you can see that mine is sitting pretty nice over here. If you see that it's snapping back, take a dish towel or something like that, cover the dough, let it sit for a few minutes, and then what's gonna happen is the dough is gonna relax enough, you come back, and all of a sudden you'll feel that you'll be able to stretch this dough even further. I do want to go back to that question about temperature because this it kind of relates to what you're saying about the dough talking to you. So Michelle had asked what the room temperature was and that's a really good thing to keep in mind when you're working with yeast with anything you make because the temperature of your room is going to either slow down the process or speed up the process. If your room is very cold, your process is going to go a little bit slower. If your room is very warm, if you live somewhere that's a very hot, humid cli climate, your dough is going to move a little quicker. So you always want to be paying attention to your dough, watching things. Um, recipes are guidelines to give you an idea of how long things might take, but you don't want to just see a time and then, and then just leave it as that and not look at your dough and see how it's going. You nailed it right on the head. And again, when we talk about this dough, all dough, is a living, breathing thing. As soon as that yeast hits the water, it's woken up and it wants to eat. And what's it looking for to eat? It's looking for things like sugar. Well, we didn't add any sugar to this dough because inside of the flour is enough simple sugars, without going too much into a chemistry lesson, there's enough simple sugars to feed the yeast during our process. And again, with the way that this whole process is working, this is what's going to give us that beautiful color as well. Um, if you find in your home oven, for whatever reason, maybe you're not getting a lot of color. If you make a pizza, you notice that the toppings are really uh, dark before the, the crust is ever really nice and brown. You could always add a little bit of sugar to the dough. Uh, and this is always one of the things that people ask, well, why do we even put sugar in dough at home? And it's really, number one, to accelerate the, the process of the way the yeast is working. And number two, they have a fancy French term called the, the Maillard effect. And the Maillard effect is that browning that happens or that caramelization when this dough goes into the oven, okay? So now, I've got this beautiful rectangle on the table. We're gonna actually start to make our calzone. I've got mozzarella. I've got house-made Italian beef. And then I've got some beautiful uh, hot jardinera, all right? So this is a, a classic Chicago combo. If you're from Chicago and you've gone anywhere and had a beef sandwich, right? The famous Chicago beef is sliced beef. This is a slow roasted uh, inside round, we would say, uh, is what the cut is that we use. Uh, we roast this really slow for about uh, three, four hours till it's really nice and uh, kind of uh, rare, medium rare in the middle. You can also go to the grocery store, go to the deli, buy yourself some uh, Italian beef from the counter and um, have them slice it nice and thin. Uh, and, and this is going to be exactly how we want to work with it. Uh, Jardinier is a relish, if you will, made of a variety of different kinds of peppers. The hotter it is, the spicier the pepper they used in the mix. There's also things like carrots and olives and peppers and uh, like uh, uh, bell peppers and celery and cauliflower. So it's kind of like this uh, giardinera refers to the giardino, which is your garden. And it really just means a variety of things that came out of the garden. So what we're going to do, go ahead, you have a question? Nope. Oh, I was going to say we do have a Chicagoan watching from Denver. Who, who hey, and Chicago and Denver, what's up? How you doing? So what I'm using over here, this is whole milk mozzarella. I really like to work with whole milk mozzarella. If you have a problem finding good mozzarella, my suggestion to you would be don't buy the stuff that's already shredded. Shred it on your own. So find yourself a nice loaf of mozzarella or go to the deli counter and say, give me like a three, four inch piece of whole milk mozzarella or you can get a piece of whole milk, a piece of part skim. What's the important thing is that 
it's low moisture, low moisture mozzarella, because the less moisture they, well, the more moisture they pull out of it when they process it, the less moisture is gonna be on the inside and it's gonna keep everything really nice and creamy, everything we love about a good pizza, right? So what I'm gonna do, in your packet, I gave you the, uh, I, I gave you the breakdown of the quantities, all right? I'm gonna just build this by eye. I've been making uh, stromboli since I was a kid. I could do this with my eyes closed. But really what we're trying to do is make a nice bed okay, if you will. And this nice bed, if I had to guess, is probably somewhere maybe about um, eight to 10 ounces, if we, uh, if we called it out like that. Uh, eight ounces is definitely a lot of mozzarella, and I think that uh, if you find a really good mozzarella, you could stick with that quality, quantity. A lot of times, you know, if you have a problem finding really good mozzarella, you're probably gonna be a little bit over because of the way that it melts. So you're probably about 10 ounces. But a nice bed of mozzarella just like this is exactly what we're looking for. The next thing that I like to do, I like to take this roast beef, which is really nice and thin sliced. A lot of people get freaked out by doing this method with roast beef that's rare because they say, well, as this cooks, is that blood, whatever's left over, is that gonna end up inside? And I'm gonna tell you, I've made this so many times that as it's in here, it's cooking and that whatever's in there, that pink is gone. So don't worry about the inside of this looking terrible or like a crime scene, it's not gonna be like that. What I'm trying to do though, instead of laying everything flat, I wanna give this some volume. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take these and just kinda of like nest, maybe make these kinda of little nests or these little dollops on top, just like this. And uh, just kind of fill this so that we've got some height. So this is nice and full. The worst thing that we can do, we went through all this work to make the dough and put all this cheese and everything. And then all of a sudden we got something flat like a pancake and, and that's not very good either. So I've got this beautiful bed of this Italian roast beef. And I've got some of this jardinera. Now jardinera is packed in olive oil, okay? So I'm gonna try to get as much of the jardinera out with as little of the oil as possible because again, I wanna try to keep this interior pretty dry. If I had all this extra oil in there or um, if the cheese was runny or anything like that, the inside would be like this sloppy mess, which we don't wanna do. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take a little of this jardinera and I'm purposely leaving this right on top because I'm gonna finish this stromboli. My stromboli I do a little bit different. I actually braid the stromboli. Our stromboli is like a roll. So we would take this roll and we would kind of roll it all up into something long, kind of like a cylinder or a tube, maybe something that would end up like a, like a, a jelly roll, right? Something like that. Now, what I'm gonna do instead is I'm gonna take a knife and I'm gonna make some slits. I'm gonna make about these one inch slits from the edge over here. A size dough like this, maybe we get about six or seven of these slits. And the slits I'm doing kind of on a bias or on an angle towards me. And I'm gonna do the same thing on the opposite side. I got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. All right, so we did eight on this one, right? Doing a little bit more. I can't take credit for this. This is, a, this is something that looks really beautiful. And again, when we do Danish or coffee cakes or whatever you call them, uh, we use this method a lot. We need a little bit of Parmesan cheese, right? We couldn't have a good uh, stromboli or calzone without some Parmesan. So I'm gonna give this a nice dusting on the inside just like this, all right? So now, this is very simple. What we're gonna do, this edge that's closest to you is gonna make a point. And all I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take this, I'm gonna take these flaps, and the idea is I'm gonna try to go to the opposite side here, and then just kind of cross as we continue to do this back and forth. As we continue to cross, if you feel like it's trying to work against you, kind of just bring it all into the middle, and it'll go back to where it needs to go. And again, just keep going, making sure that we uh, alternate our pattern evenly. And the great thing about this, the thing that I love a lot, is that when this is all done and we make this braid and it proofs and bakes in the oven, all of that dough is gonna rise and that filling kind of pushes through the braid a little bit. And that's the reason why I did the jardinera on top because occasionally you can see those little bits of the jardinera peeking through. Maybe I can lift this up and turn it towards you. I'm gonna show you the last turn. I've got this kind of tail, right? I've heard this a lot, it looks like a fish or whatever you want. What I've done, um, there is actually a, a Turkish bread that we make a lot, right? 
we take this final point, fold it over, and then this point over here, we're going to take, we're going to fold it underneath, and we're going to tuck it into the bottom. And this is going to kind of hold it in place while it's getting ready to bake and going into the oven. So now we've got this kind of beautiful loaf, just like this, and this is ready to go on a sheet pan. Now, I'm using uh, just a half sheet pan, if you've got a half, like a cookie sheet, something like that. I like to work on a piece of parchment paper because the parchment paper is going to be kind of like this nonstick surface, but the thing I love the most about it is that I hate washing dishes. <laughs> so if you've never had the luxury or the opportunity to scrub a sheet pan or a cookie sheet after it's leaked cheese or whatever, you're going to love the idea of using parchment. All right? So now I'm going to put this on the side just like this, and then very gently I'm going to lift this whole thing up and I'm going to set this right into the middle, okay? Now, this recipe for this dough, you can see that one of my dough balls, 412 grams, made a really nice stromboli this size, which if we were to cut this down, this could easily feed three people, maybe four, depending on whose house you're in. My house, maybe this is two. You know, depending on where you're at, this is going to change that number of servings, right? If you say, Leo, this is a lot of dough, what can I do? I don't want to make this much dough. You can very simply just cut all the volume of ingredients in half, okay? Once you see that these volume uh, ingredients are in half, mixed in the same exact process as we just did. And um, if you want to make a bigger batch like this and you're not going to use all the dough, you can actually take those dough balls as soon as you make them nice and round, put them inside a, either a disposable uh, kind of a container with one of those resealable lids, or maybe stick it inside of a zip top bag, and then toss them in the freezer. You can easily freeze this dough for 30 days. When you're ready to thaw it out, take the dough, stick it in the refrigerator for about 24 hours, or at least overnight, and then before you do anything with it, let it sit on the counter ambiently, let it warm up to room temperature at least 90 minutes, and then go ahead and do this exact same process that we just did, all right? Now, the last thing that we're gonna do, normally, I would finish this with uh, sesame seeds. Today, I'm not gonna use sesame seeds, I'm gonna use just the egg wash. Again, if there's people, sometimes people are sensitive to, to sesame seeds, they can't eat them, just exclude them. If you want, when we're gonna make, we're gonna make the egg wash, all I'm gonna do, I'm gonna take a, a couple eggs just like this. Really for one, if I was only doing a, one or two of these, I would use just one egg. I'm gonna take about a tablespoon of water per egg. I'm gonna just go really quick, put it over here. And then to this, I'm just gonna give this a quick whisk, all right? And this is what we call our egg wash, our classic egg wash. This is really not, nothing crazy. Some people use milk in theirs. I just use water and eggs. And we don't wanna cover this like we're making an omelet, right? We want just a little bit and we're a nice just a brushing on the outside. And what's gonna happen is, this is gonna give us that beautiful, nice, shiny exterior. Kinda of like, you know, when you see a nice French pastry or the shine that you might see like on the outside of maybe a, a nice croissant. Croissant's a little bit different, but again, just understand what the outside of that looks like. This is what the egg wash is gonna do. If you have an allergy or something, you can't use eggs for whatever reason, just omit it. You don't have to do this step. You can actually just stick it right into the oven just like this and it'll bake really nice. We do want it uniform though because if you don't do this nice and uniform, it is going to look a little blotchy, which we don't like that. So all of a sudden we've got this. This is really nice and beautiful. All right. So I'm going to stick this inside an oven. My oven has two racks and on top of each rack I've got a baking stone or a pizza stone. My pizza stones are rectangular. They're from a company called Emile Henry. These are actually from Burgundy in France, all right? I'm setting my, calz I'm sorry, my stromboli on the stone on the bottom, and then I have another one on top. If you ever notice that when you make your pizzas, the, the, the cheese of the pizza is burnt and the bottom is still white, um, the reason is because inside of this oven you've got a thermostat that's just kicking on and off and the element is firing on top of your, your whatever you're baking, right? By putting a pizza stone on top, we're creating an even uh, cooking surface, an even heat, right? So that thermostat can kick on and off, that element can go on and off as much as it want, wants, but the stone is actually protecting 
what you're baking. By using the two stone method like this, now what we're doing is we're kind of recreating the chamber of, let's say, our brick pizza ovens in a, in a pizzeria, if you will. So this is going to extend the bake time. It's going to give you a crispier bottom. The bottom is going to be more uniform brown. Your cheese is going to take a little bit longer to cook. So instead of being like one sheet of brown on top, you're going to see this beautiful creamy white mozzarella, and then you're going to see these little brown spots, which we call toast points. So this is the proper way to do it. So our stromboli is in the oven. My oven is set at 500 degrees, okay? And then this is going to bake somewhere for between 20 to 25 minutes. You know your oven better than I do, so you're going to know if you're going to need a little bit more time. The good thing is that everything that's inside over here is cooked. So you don't have to worry about getting anything, anybody sick or maybe that it's undercooked or whatever like that. So here is my uh, stromboli all done. But if you can uh, hear this, it's actually making that crackle just like a fresh loaf of bread when it comes out of the oven, right? So I'm gonna take this by the paper, transfer this nice and simple. You can see why we like to use the parchment paper because it releases really nice and, and easily. And then here you have it. We've got our beautiful uh, stromboli all done really nice, right? So let's leave this here and then we'll, we'll let it cool for a minute. We don't want to cut this right away because everything inside is going to be really loose and it's all going to flow to the side. So let it sit for a minute and cool down. You could also do this ahead of time, let it cool and then pop it back into the oven for a few minutes just to warm it up and then cut your slices, which we're going to do here in a minute. So I'm, going, I'm using a serrated knife. Okay, serrated knife because we're gonna treat this just like a loaf of bread. I want it to cut really nice and even, right? I don't wanna to have to press down on this a lot because I wanna make sure that I protect these cross sections, all right? So um, this on the outside is really nice and crispy, but I can feel that it's soft on the inside as well, if that makes sense. So crispy on the outside, nice and soft, bread-like in the middle. We let it cool down for a little bit, so the mozzarella cheese and everything inside has had a chance to kind of come together and kind of just uh, be nice and uh, homogenous, if you will, on the inside. And then to this, I'm going to cut the, uh, the end piece off. This is in my house. This is usually the piece that everybody fights for because it's nice and bready. I'm going to start to make these cuts all right straight across i'll do a few of these just like this and i'm trying to cut within the braids right so i'm not trying to disturb the braids because i want to be able to see them so i'm cutting right down in the middle into the braids i'm putting this all the way underneath just like this so that i can actually lift this now put this back onto my platter i can actually fan these pieces apart and you can actually see that beautiful cheese pull over here. Isn't that gorgeous? And the inside of this is stuffed. You can see all that beautiful Italian roast beef and that, uh, that jardinera on the inside. Krista, I'm gonna give you a nice uh, center oh, cut. Right. Look how beautiful this is. I will argue with that. <laughs> so you can have this one here. Thank you. I don't know about you, I can't wait uh, to okay. bite into this thing anymore. I don't look like this for nothing. Let's go with your hands. You could use your knife and fork if you want. I grew up that this is finger food in our house. So I'm gonna go ahead, I'm just gonna eat this. But the great thing is it's kind of like a little sandwich, a little handheld sandwich and uh, salute. So everybody, thank you so much. On behalf of all of our friends at Red Star Yeast, we'd like to thank you for joining us today. Uh, I really appreciate uh, Baker Betty being here. And uh, on behalf of all of us at the North American Pizza and Culinary Academy, we hope to see you in class very soon. Bye, everybody. Bye.